thank you for today. Thank you, Father, for the beautiful morning we have outside. Thank you for the sun shining. Thank you, Father, for the sun being in here, your sun. We thank you, Father, for your word. We pray as we look into it today that you would speak to our hearts. Draw us closer to you, Lord. Draw us closer to one another, Father. Be with those today that are struggling. Lord, you know each and every one of our hearts. You know those that aren't here yet, and uh, for whatever reason, the ones that can't make it. We just pray that you would meet us where we need you to meet us today, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so, you know, I always like to have a little bit of class participation. I did expect the class to be a little bit bigger, but obviously the important people are here. The important people are here. And this is more, it's not more of a Sunday school lesson as more of a glorified, amplified um, object lesson. And have I got an object lesson for you today. Um, I need someone to start off. Ben, I need you to open up your Bible to Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7. I need you to read that for us, all right? It was one of the, I hate to say it, but it's one of the few... Um, memory verses that I, I did years ago with the Christian Service Brigade. What is that? Nahum 1 7. It's one of the mi minor prophets. I should have done a sword drill. Go ahead, Pastor, please. Okay, very good. All right. I have a question. How many good people we have in the room? Good people do we have in the room? Ah, very good. Who is good? Like Denise just said, what standard are you going by? Now, if it wasn't for the fact that you are members and or congregants of the Center Reach Bible Church, would you have put your hand up and thought to yourself, oh, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I, I pray with pastor every Sunday morning in the office, and then I come up here, and, you know, I teach Sunday school, and I'm a pretty decent husband, I would think, a decent father. So I, I'm a pretty good guy. I bring up my neighbor's garbage cans because they're old, and not the garbage cans aren't old, but the neighbor's are old. Um, so, you know, I do these things that, you know, the world would look at me and say, wow, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I try to do the speed limit, I try to be courteous on the road, and I do all these things. And uh, what does it mean to be good? By any standard, what, what would you consider good? Not hurting others. All right, not hurting others. What else? Helpful. Obeying, Helpful. The, law. Obeying the law. Which law? God's law or man's law? Both. Both. All right, anything else? Truthful. These are all attributes of someone that's a good person. All right? Raise your hand if you try not to sin. Raise your hand if you sin. That's an easy one. Um, now let me ask you another question. Who would consider themselves hypersensitive to not sin. Depending on where you're at with the Holy Spirit. I think when the Holy Spirit <clears throat> currently I'm walking with the Holy Spirit, I don't mean I am right now. I'm saying when you when I am, I'm more hypersensitive than what I'm not. Right. Okay, so our intention as a believer in Christ is to what? Not sin. All right, so we try to be good. All right, we know the Bible says. I mean, like I said, you know, we come to the Center Reach Bible Church. We are we're taught, we're trained, we read in Scripture. 
that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good, only good is Jesus, the Father in heaven, Holy Spirit. We know that. But for what I'm trying to find out today is when we say that we become a Christian, we are supposed to be hypersensitive to sin. So it's a situation of we try not to sin, but oftentimes we do. I thought it was interesting. I looked it up. Um, my Sunday school lesson was completely different than what I had planned on doing. I was going to do something on God the Rock, and uh, it was not that way at all. God had a whole different, a whole different uh, idea. All right. What is sin? What? Disobedience. All right. Who, what? Did, Sam, did you say something? Nope. Okay. I said so. I said okay. Missing the mark. Missing the mark. Okay. We could say anything that separates us from God, anything that is not according to God's will. All right. I looked it up on. I typed it in on uh, on Google, and it says, um, "What are the two types of sin in the Bible?" An involuntary sin is a sin that we commit because of the weakness of our flesh or because we are ignorant of a law that we are breaking. In other words, these sins are not done deliberately. On the other hand, voluntary sin is done by those who know what they are doing is wrong, but they do it anyway. All right? The biblical definition of sin is found in 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of the law in the King James Version. To sin is to transgress or break the law of God. The Bible says a lot about sin. It tells us all of sin and that sin leads to death, both found in Romans. All right, so we know those things. So we, who takes precautions not to sin most of the time? I'll say that most of the time. Who takes precautions to not sin? What might that look like? Okay. All right, what else? What are some precautions we can take to not sin? Reading God's word. Reading God's word. That's a great one. Going to church. Going to church. What? Prayer. Prayer. What else? Fellowshipping with other believers. Avoiding those things that we know are not good for us. Things that will take us down a road that we really shouldn't be going. The Bible says that in Proverbs 3, 7, also in Psalm 37, 27, and in 34, 14, that we're supposed to depart from evil. All right, so like I said before, I like doing sword drills. That was um, one of the things I'm going to have you swords up real high. Bible's up high. I'm going to give you a verse. First one there reads it. But don't do it until I tell you. Don't look until I say charge. Proverbs chapter 3 in verse 7, charge. Go ahead. Apart from evil. Bible's way up high for those over 20 years old. <laughs> Proverbs chapter, I mean, Psalm 37, verse 27, charge. Go ahead. 37, verse 27. Go ahead. 3727. All right. Also in Psalm 34, verse 14, we're not supposed to give place for the devil in Ephesians 427. 
We're supposed to depart from evil and do good. Several times in scripture we see that. Last one for everybody. James 4 verse 17 charge. James 4:17. Got it. Okay, so for those of us who are believers, if we know we're not supposed to do something and we do it, it's sin. Now, the whole reason I'm using this as all as a, a preface, did you ever start out doing something with the right frame of mind, with the right intention, and find yourself in a place that's not a good place to be? Whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, or whatever. Yes, put your hand up if you've ever had that happen. You started out with the best of intentions and found out, wow. Now, I like to use this for the Bible app. I like looking at the silly videos that show up on Instagram. For those of you who have Facebook and have tried to message me, the only reason Elijah put Facebook on this for me is because I have access to Facebook Marketplace now. But it has the same silly videos that a lot of the other ones have. But you could start off doing something very innocent, and then within a few short clicks, you find yourself in a place that, wow, this isn't really the place for me to be. Now, that's not necessarily what you're thinking right now. Okay? Okay. I like looking at old classic cars. A 1970 Chevelle SS 396 with cowl induction, mag wheels, cherry red, midnight blue metallic, a 55 or a 55, a 55 or a 57 Chevy Nomad with a canary yellow paint job. I look at those and I'm like, We have somebody in the room right now that's got a little deuce coupe under construction, and it's like, wow, that's so cool. And I could get down a rabbit hole and go, wow, I wish I had that. Why don't I have that? I would really like that. Now, put your hand up if you can ever relate to that type of a situation where something that you looked at was innocent, now all of a sudden it's like, wow, you start you know, coveting something. Pastors talked about it. We've all talked about it from the Sunday school pulpit, you know, we, we start out with the best of intentions and we wind up in a place that's not that great. Now, I'm going to share something. Some of you may have heard it before. Some of you may have never heard it before. But a precursor to this, or a, uh, what do they call that, to cover myself, this is something that was shared by a woman in a room, in an auditorium, full of women. All right, so let me just see where I'm at here. If I can find it. <clears throat> Sorry, just bear with me just for a moment. Tried saving it in another location to have it a little more accessible, but it didn't work. All right, listen. It's called the Husband Store. And you can go, everybody heard about the new store in New York City? It's called the Husband Store. And you can go there and shop for a husband. There are six floors in this store. You can only visit each floor one time, though. At each floor you go up, the value increases. You may choose any item from any particular floor, but you cannot. You can go up a floor, but you cannot go back down. So there was a woman who went to the husband's store to find herself a husband. On the first floor, the sign on the door read, These men have jobs. That sounded good. These men have jobs. Floor two says, These men have jobs and love kids. Floor number three said, These men have jobs, love kids, and are extremely good looking. Wow, she thought, this is sounding pretty good, but I'm compelled to go on to the next floor. Well, she does go to the fourth floor, and the sign reads, These men have jobs, love kids, are drop-dead, good-looking, and they help with the housework. Oh, mercy me, she said. I can hardly stand it. Still, she said, I've got to go on. 
She went to the fifth floor. These men have jobs, love kids, are drop dead gorgeous, help with the housework, and have a very strong romantic streak. But she couldn't stand it. She decided she had to just find out what was on floor number six. Floor number six said, you are visitor 31,456 to this floor. There are no men on this floor. This floor exists solely as proof that women are impossible to please. <laughs> now, like I said, the precursor to that was it was it was shared by a woman for a room full of women. So I'm not picking on the ladies today, because the same thing could be said about said about I'm not going to say all men, but most men who go through the Home Depot tool department. You walk through the Home Depot tool department and it's like, wow, I wish I had that. Wow, I don't have that one. That's a better one than I have. And it's, we start out with the best of intentions. And the whole reason I, I brought this up, um, Rory made a comment about, I, I've got uh, a lot of sun on me. And I said, yeah, I've been spending a lot of time in the yard. So this, the past few days, um, now being retired, I have all of this free time on my hands and I'm able to do some of the, the gardening and weeding and beds and stuff that we have in our yard. So I spent some time in the backyard on my hands and knees clearing a bed that had all kinds of vegetation and good plants and bad plants and weeds and vines and all kinds of stuff. Now, um, I found myself at the end of the day, my shoulders were hurting, my hands were sore, I was on my knees, really dirty, really sweaty, and I thought, this is going to look so good when I'm done. But how many people are allergic to poison ivy? All right, I looked it up. 85% of Americans are allergic to, to poison ivy. 15% of people aren't. But the majority of people... now. Those of you who are allergic to poison ivy, do you ever go into a flower bed or the woods and it's, it happens to be one of the healthiest, most prevalent plants for those of you who grew up on Long Island? Everywhere we go, poison ivy. Denise and I have seen leaves this big. Right around the corner from where we live, there's a sump on the edge of the street and the leaves on this thing, it, they're like this big, just huge. My point is, is I went into this flower bed with the best of intentions, and I'm pretty aware of what poison ivy looks like. I didn't see it. When I did see it, I took what I thought were the right precautions. I put on rubber gloves. When I know I'm going to be doing stuff with poison ivy, I'll make sure I have long sleeves on. I'll put on rubber gloves. And when I'm done, I carefully take the rubber gloves and I throw them out. Elijah helped me move a ladder. There was a little thing there, a vine. Got rid of it, no problem. Day and a half later, I wake up. My arm is covered from here to here with poison ivy. I have it on my legs. I have it on some areas I'd rather not mention. I have it all over my body. I was not intending on getting poison ivy, but I got it because I didn't see it. If I saw it, I would have taken the right precautions. And that's how it is with sin. When we know we're entering into an area that we shouldn't be in, a lot of times we take the right precautions. And what are they? One, we talked about it, you avoid the television, the computer, whatever it is that pulls you away. We should go to God in prayer. We should prep ourselves if we're going to be in an area that we're not supposed to be in. And I don't mean, you know, um, geographically. You're going to have a talk with someone and you know it's not going to end well. You have an, an issue with the family. You have an, an issue at work. Whatever it is. Prep yourself. Go to the Word. Go to the Bible. Go to God in prayer. There's things that we do to prep. But sometimes we... Even though we take those precautions, things happen. Things happen. Anybody ever been burned while cooking or while at work? If you've ever cooked something in the kitchen, 
if you've ever worked in the garage, on a car, woodworking, doesn't matter what it is. The tools get hot, the pans get hot. I feel bad for Emma. She was working at a place in Patrog, and you know, every week she was coming home with a new burn on her. And it's like, what happened? Oh, I was moving the cookie sheets and I got burned. I got this or whatever. You know, um, we get burned. You take the precautions to not get burned, but yet if you're, you're in that vicinity, chances are you're going to get burned. So what I'm seeing and what I'm just trying to share with you today, what can we do to prevent to get, to getting burned? Take the proper precautions. Put on the, put on the, the mitts. Use a, the, use the holders and all that. Put ourselves in a position where we're not going to get, we're not going to get burned. So, Denise said to me two days ago. She goes, you know, this calamine lotion in the bathroom, and uh, you can you can put that on. So as I was trying to prepare for the my lesson on the rock, God being the rock, I'm sitting at the table and I couldn't concentrate because the itching got so bad, I just wanted to rip my arm apart. I just wanted to scratch it. I just wanted to scratch it. When you have poison ivy, what do they tell you not to do? And I'm thinking, I don't really need the calamine lotion. I could do it on my own. Can't do it on my own. And I started thinking about poison ivy and sin. Sin separates us from God. And when we try on our own to get back to God, we can't. What does it take to get us back to God? Repentance, Repentance confession. You know, I would, well, I'm going to say it anyway. If you have your Bible, those of you under 18, but over 20. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Lad. Got to give everybody else a chance. Come on. <laughs> and I know a lot of you know it, but I need you to go to it anyway. First John 1 9. You know, I, I'm sitting at the table this morning. Once you get there, just get the Bible, get it going. And, what? I know. Oh. Just have your Bible ready. I'm not on the corner. I said over twenty under <laughs> As I'm sitting there thinking I can't concentrate, I'm having a hard time. I get up and I go into the bathroom and I put on the calamine lotion. Now it's, it's funny because I put my long sleeve shirt on about an hour and a half ago and my arm was as red as the pew and the bumps were going crazy. And now I just pulled it up to show you guys and I'm like, it's not as bad as it was this morning. I mean, it is, but it's not as bad as it was this morning. And the reason is, I put this on. I'm going to put it on right now <laughs> because it's starting to itch again. And I started thinking how this calamine lotion, I was kind of being a little bit prideful, I guess you will. I don't need that stuff. I really don't. I don't need that medication to put it on because I can handle it. And as long as I don't think about it or nothing's touching it, it wasn't as itchy as it was this morning. We, Denise has a nephew. This kid used to get all kinds of issues with his skin when he was little, and I could remember, what was it, um, from his head to the bottom of his feet, he would be caked in pink because it was so bad on him. And it's like, I don't need that. I don't need, and you know what? I did need it because it's starting to heal already because I used it. The blood of Jesus Christ does what? <laughs> Cleanses us. First John one nine charge. All right, we'll get there. Then read it. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we know, even though we confess, what it is? What is it that cleansed us? 
it's the blood of Christ. And I was like, what a parallel between something as silly, and I don't mean to, to disrespect Scripture, and I don't mean to disrespect the blood of Christ, but when we're covered in the blood, it draws us back to Christ. It brings us back to Christ. We're able to do those things that he expects of us, and we are able to concentrate because we're not dwelling on the sin that took us away from him in the first place. You know? I'm going to read. If you want, you can follow along. I know a lot of us have the King James, and that's usually what I use. But this morning, I'm going to use the New Living Translation. And it's a section in the book of Romans in chapter 7. And it, Paul talking to the Romans about sin and reading it in this version, you know, God's law reveals our sin. Well then, Paul says, I am suggesting in verse 7 that the law of God is sin. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the, law, the power of sin came to life, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my death? Of course not. Sin used, sin used what was good to bring out my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's, goods, God's good commands for its own evil purposes. In verse 14, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living within me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is so that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. And even though we have a sinful nature and even though we are slaves to sin, we have the ability to go to Christ and be covered by his blood to have him cleanse us from our unrighteousness, try to do those things that are good, but not because it's the goodness in us, it's because of the goodness of the Father. And I just, like I said, the parallel or the thought of how <clears throat> the, the poison ivy I was trying to do a good thing, and I was taking all the precautions, but I found myself in it. And that portion of scripture made me think of the things I try to do that are right, but I, sometimes I find myself in a place that I'm not supposed to be. Now, that sin that, that he's talking about and the sin that you could relate to might be completely different. It could be, a, it could be anything. I, it's too, too numerous to mention some of the sins that so easily beset us gossiping coveting sexual immorality you know 
any of the any of them they draw us away from Christ but through the Holy Spirit and through the blood of Christ we have a way to get back to him so that we could start our healing let's, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer Father in heaven we do thank you again for this morning we thank you for your word Lord it is alive it is true and Father when we stop and realize that you love us so very much that you are there to cleanse us you just want to have a right relationship with us we pray that you would help us to walk away and turn our backs from the sins that so easily beset us and that we would be able to draw close to you and have you fill us with your goodness we just pray that you be with pastor this morning be with the music ministry thank you so much father for your blessings to us in jesus name amen